Hey, this video is probably going to be pretty short, but uh, I wanted to talk about one of the things that I've been running into a lot with Zig that I think I just realized a solution for. Uh, so I have been migrating a couple projects over to Zig, writing a couple things in Zig from scratch, and one of the things that I've ran into a couple times is uh, segmentation faults. And I there are a lot of ways that you can have a segmentation fault, uh, but I wasn't doing anything that felt like it was really in the path of, um, you know, like uh, memory manipulation or anything like that, that felt a little more prone to a seg fault. However, what I found out was actually really interesting. So uh, in one of my most recent videos, I posted some zig code. Um, I'm not going to pull that up. I'll just, uh, instead, what I'll do is show you in a new project over here, actually a, a new file. Okay, so uh, ignore everything else that I've got up right now. Uh, this is for a completely separate project, but the thing that I want to show you is if I create a new zig and a new go uh, file, um, the, the thing that I really want to bring home is the idea that, uh, let's make this, this one go. They're different, they're different languages, and that's very obvious. But my background is recently has, has been a lot of Go. So I see a lot of similarities between Go and Zig. So when I see things in Zig that exist in Go, I assume they work like they do in Go. It turns out that's not the case. So if I create a new function here called do something in Go, and what this does is maybe um, uh, if, so let's go ahead and assign like a variable up here, right? So something like, um, name is John, if 30 is greater than 20, which it is. This is maybe a bad example because maybe this, this would be a value that gets passed in. But the point being, you have a conditional here where you do something like name is actually then equal to Doe. We choose these last names for whatever reason. And then you print the name. Like this, this totally makes sense. This is actually a really contrived example in Go. But uh, you might want to do something where you defer in this section right here. So maybe you're deferring some cleanup. Maybe you're deferring... Um, actually, you know what? We can just defer a function, and that function sets the name to Smith. This will actually really bring that home. Okay, so I don't know why I saved that. I don't need to save that. If we execute through this, what will happen here is the name gets assigned to John. This conditional is true. So then we have the name assigned to Doe, and then we establish a defer function. We print line the name, and then the defer function runs after, right here, defer function runs here. So this defer runs at the end of the function that it's defined in. Okay, so there are a lot of ways that this is different. Uh, I just pasted this example. Uh, this is this is a, a not a one-to-one -one mapping, but we'll convert it to a one-to-one -one mapping here in just a second. So we can do something like, um, well, we, we really need the allocator to drive this home. So these examples aren't going to be one-to-one, -one, but the point being that this, this feels pretty obvious how this executes. To see the consequences of that execution in Zig, we need a little bit of a more advanced example, but I think this should be pretty straightforward. So I have a function called handle CD. It has an allocator and it takes in some args. Uh, those args get assigned to a variable called path, and then we get some environment variables or something. You know, uh, that's that's what we're doing in this case, but you, you could do whatever. We're deferring, deinitializing this environment map. This runs right here. Totally makes sense. However, where this gets interesting is if we were to do something like this instead and we have our environment map, and we have our defer, and we defer right here. So this, this shocked me. This was not what I expected. So this feels cleaner to me. You don't do any unnecessary allocations um, unless you absolutely need them, So this, unless this conditional is true in this case. So this, this tripped me up a ton. This defer executes. This is a, actually a bad example. This defer should be right here. However, spoiler, that defer executes right here. So this is a scope. This is a block of code. The defer is bound to this context right here and will execute when we leave this scope. 
not this function, this scope. So you get into a really weird spot where if you have this code like I have right here, we have this environment map that we allocate memory for, we defer deinitializing it, and then we get an item from that map. This path right here, that memory is freed at the end of this scope. So if we try to access it down here, we get a segmentation fault. So if you saw the code that I had at the beginning here, that's how you would fix this problem. One of, one of many ways you could fix this problem, I should say. Uh, this does introduce another problem where we are unnecessarily allocating here with our allocator. So we're getting the environment map, even if we don't really use it, because we only use it in this one case, right? So that's, that's an issue that you're running into if you take this approach. Um, you could also grab all of this, put it right here, and then copy all of this and put it right here. And then wrap all this in an else and do this conditionally. That's probably a more, I mean, it, it is a more um, performant memory focused optimization you could do, uh, but now you have duplicate code. So you obviously would wanna probably do something to handle that duplicate code, whether that's pulling out it out into another function um, or whatever, you have a lot of options. Anyways, the point I'm getting at here is that I did not realize that, so if I search for go defer, really great documentation on it in the tour of go, defer statement defers the execution of a function until the surrounding function returns, exactly what I said. But if we search for zig defer, what we'll find uh, is two different things. The zig guide's pretty good at this, um, but we could actually look at the language reference as well. So I'm gonna pull them both up. They have an example of this actually working like you would expect here. So they, they showcase that this is used upon exiting the current block, not the current function like in Go. Um, which one's right? I don't know, they both work. There's just something you need to know, right? So if you're writing Zig, especially if you came from Go, defer does not work the exact same way. It solves the same problems. Arguably, this is more flexible but realistically, when you think about it from an allocation perspective, you might want to handle cleaning up the defers at the end of the function, so it might be a little misleading or confusing. However, the point that I'm getting at is if you run into seg faults because you're allocating something and you're deferring the freeing of that memory and maybe accessing it somewhere in between, um, this, this is probably your problem. It's, it's been my problem. I run into this, I won't say all the time, but it, way more than I would care to admit. So anyways, uh, quick little video on defer and, well, defer. Defer and go and defer and zig. Hopefully you found this helpful, especially if you are coming from go like myself. Um, I'm, this was huge for me, so hopefully it will be for you as well. Uh, if you found the video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Let me know what you found helpful about it in the comments below. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. We have videos coming out about all sorts of zig things, and I really enjoy the opportunity to talk with the community in the comments. Uh, I've learned so much from you all, and hopefully you've learned a lot from me as well. Thanks, and have a great day.